All right, I think I'm going to go ahead. Um, uh, once again, welcome to the Global Prep Learning Network. We have really great representation today from across many countries. I'm glad to have you all here. Uh, right now we're at 66, 67 participants, and I expect we'll have some more joining um, as we continue. Um, but my name is Christine Torreson. I'm from FHI 360 in North Carolina. I'm the co-director of the Choice Collaboration, which is a um, a collaboration that sits uh, within the EPIC and RISE projects funded by USAID and PEPFAR. Um, and we are pleased to host the Global Prep Learning Network series. And today we're very pleased to be talking about updated WHO guidance on laboratory monitoring and also to hear um, results and, and reflections on the GEMS project, which focused on HIV drug resistance monitoring for PrEP. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have uh, some uh, housekeeping and, and, and guidance here to go through. So we do have French interpretation available today. Uh, and you can see the instructions here where you can click on the little globe that says uh, interpretation and, um, and select your language. Um, if you have any questions about this or any challenges with this, please reach out to Casey. Casey Bishop in the um, chat. Actually, Casey, are you the right one or is there somebody else who should, is, will be helping with translation? No, that's fine. People can ping me. Okay, great. All right, next slide, please. Um, oh, I, I, did we have a slide just about how to use the chat function or do we don't have that anymore? No, okay. So, oh, there. Oh, it's later after I introduce people, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so this was just a reminder that throughout the, the session today, you are welcome to um, uh, use the chat both to ask questions, but also to provide comments or share your experience. We do ask that you select, uh, either, it will either say everyone or all panelists and attendees. So please do select that when you put your chat so that everyone can see um, your comments and questions. Um, and we'll go back to our introductions. So we're really delighted today to have Irvi Parikh here from the University of Pittsburgh. She's an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and the associate director of the Virology Core Microbicide Trials Network for the Microbicide Trials Network. And she was the co-lead of the GEMS project and uh, which we will be hearing more about today. And um, we also have Robin Schaefer from the World Health Organization from WHO. He works for the Testing Prevention and Populations Unit of the Global HIV, Hepatitis, and STI program of the WHO, and he works on PrEP for HIV prevention. Um, he is leading an effort now to focus on more simplified service delivery and new PrEP products, which we're very excited about, and we'll hear some of those today. And he holds a PhD in infectious disease epidemiology. So welcome to Irvi and Robin. In addition to Irvi and Robin, we have some other uh, speakers, panelists joining us today. Anita Hetema from FHI 360 is a technical advisor for uh, FHI 360's biomedical prevention product portfolio in Eswatini and was the GEMS project lead for the HIV drug resistance project uh, in Eswatini. Bhavna Chohan is a senior research scientist in the Center for Virus Research at the Kenya Medical Research Institute in Nairobi and an, a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Global Health at University of Washington. And she was the GEMS project lead for the Kenya HIV Drug Resistance Project. Next slide. Everleen Bosek is also from the University of Pittsburgh. She's a project management professional with experience in implementation science, community health, and mobile projects. And she was the GEMS project manager for the Kenya HIV DR project. And Lisa Levy from from FHI 360 is the associate project director for the Microbicide Trials Network and uh, the Impact Network um, and led the policy team for GEMS. Next slide. Okay, we already went through our uh, housekeeping here, uh, but just a reminder to feel free to use the chat. Uh, please do select French if you would like French interpretation. Let Casey know if there are any challenges. And with that, we'll, we'll dive right into our updates from the 2021 WHO Consolidated HIV Guidelines. So over to you, Robin. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me today to um, speak about some of the updates and the new WHO Consolidated HIV Guidelines 
focusing here particularly on laboratory monitoring and, and testing for oral prep. If you go to the next slide, just as a bit of background um, on WHO guidance on PrEP. Um, you can see here a bit of a timeline that the first um, the guidance came out in 2012 at that time, still PrEP being only recommended for certain populations. And then in 2015, um, PrEP was recommended for all people at substantial risk of HIV, which at the time was provisionally defined uh, as population with a HIV incidence of more than 3% uh, in the absence of PrEP. And then moving forward, um, there's new guidance that was released on event-driven oral PrEP use in 2019. And then this year, um, new, gui um, a, a new consolidated guidelines, which included updates on oral PrEP, but also on the, the PIVING ring. Um, and one noteworthy change, and I'm not going to go into that many details there, is that we're moving a bit away from the way we're, we're talking about substantial risk in these new guidelines. So I recommend looking into that, that we emphasize that the, the focus on HIV incidence in the 2015-16 guidelines was provisionally defined at the time um, with a focus on cost effectiveness, whereas now we really you know, need to consider that um, within population, there's a huge diversity in risks that need to be recognized. If you go to the next slide, the, the kind of more earlier guidance of WHO on PrEP was kind of guided by, by a very cautious approach because there was limited um, implementation experience outside of, of high-income um, settings and, and small um, pilot studies. And then really, that we should follow a more of a do no harm uh, principle. Um, but if we go to, to the next slide, we're going, thinking, going forward, um, the, some of this has changed with much more experience uh, with PrEP implementation being available and WHO to some degree facing criticism uh, of its guidance and um, that it is in many ways um, too complicated and too medicalized uh, and sometimes even be used as a excuse not to implement PrEP. So going forward, we are, um, we're trying to really take um, that expanded experience into account when we are thinking about revising our guidance on PrEP implementation and also thinking about capital A going forward. Um, so now in the next slide, actually going into the, the meat of this presentation, which is uh, you know, the, the new um, consolidated HIV guidelines published in July, 2021. And uh, a couple of highlights from that, uh, one big highlight is that it includes guidance on the, the Piven vagina ring, which is uh, the first time that we have a new additional prep option for cisgender women. So it's a big highlight, and I'm not going to talk about it any further in this presentation, but we all are very excited about this. For this presentation, I'm going to um, focus on three, um, th three, three topics um, from the new guidelines. One is about renal function monitoring, then about HIV testing and specifically self-testing, and one is about viral hepatitis. Um, yes, exactly. On the next slide, um, going into renal function monitoring, um, generally impaired kidney function, which is indicated by a creatinine clearance of under 60 milliliters per milliliters per minute, is a contraindication for using oral PAP um, containing TDF. Originally, WHO guidance, as I was saying, was cautious and conservative and suggested to use um, to monitor kidney function in oral PrEP users. In the new guidance, we're changing this to some degree. This is based on a literature review of published literature. Um, you can see some of the results here that show, yes, there is an association in, in, that was found in the clinical trials on oral PrEP between oral PrEP use and um, some impacts on kidney function. But generally speaking, these were mild effects. Kidney adverse events were mild in these trials and very rare. So this is the trial data. In addition, if you go to the next slide, the WHO has done an analysis, which was a huge collaborative effort. And some of the contributors to this effort are on the call right now, I'm sure where we looked at data from over 18,000 PrEP users globally from 15 different countries, 18 different programs, and found 
that um, very few individuals, less than half a percent of those individuals that were screened for PrEP initiation had a creatinine clearance of under 60 milliliters per minute, which would be a contraindication for all PrEP use. So very few individuals have this contraindication when they were screened for PrEP. And among those individuals who initiate PrEP and had follow-up uh, measurements, only two and a half percent roughly experienced such a kidney adverse event. Um, so again, a very small proportion experienced such negative impacts on kidney function. And specifically, there was a clear age gradient in the risk of experience it with markedly higher uh, risk among all the age groups, particularly those um, among um, those aged 50 and older. And there was also an association of your baseline creatinine clearance um, and um, experiencing a drop in creatinine clearance later. So based on this effort, both the systematic review of the literature and this global analysis, um, we revised guidance on renal function mon uh, monitoring or PrEP users. And that summarizes in the next slide, which, um, which this diagram summarizes. And we are saying now that because um, creatinine clearance events of under 60 milliliters per minute are very rare among young people under the age of 30. We're saying that those young people under the age of 30 that have no kidney related comorbidities, such as um, hypertension or diabetes, for those um, creatinine screening at baseline is, is optional. It may be considered in some settings, but we are saying it's optional because it is very rare. And similarly, at follow-up, it continues to be optional until um, uh, these individuals reach an old age of 30 or develop kidney-related comorbidities. Of course, if a program chooses to do baseline um, screening of creatinine clearance, and there's a baseline an individual is found to have a creatinine clearance under 90 millimeters per minute, then it is suggested to follow up these individuals with additional um, screenings every six to 12 months. So this is, the, sorry, please go back. Um, so this is for under 30. Then in the slightly older age group, 30 to 49 year olds, uh, it is suggested to do creatinine screening once around the time of PrEP initiation. So within one to three months after PrEP initiation. And for those individuals who are baselined, have a normal creatinine clearance uh, of over 90, again, we're saying it's optional to do further screenings because those individuals are at very low risk of developing any kidney adverse events. If it's found to be under 90, it is suggested to do regular for, um, uh, screenings six to 12 months later. And then finally, what we are saying in the new guidance is that for anyone, of, for anyone who has any kidney related comorbidities like hypertension or diabetes of any age or those age 50 and older, it is suggested to similarly do one, uh, do one screening at baseline one to three months after PrEP initiation and then screening every six to 12 months. So the key message here from this diagram for young people under the age of 30 with no kidney related comorbidities, which it's a huge proportion of global PrEP users. We are saying um, perhaps, um, th these PrEP users can be initiated with an, without creatinine screening and creatinine screening is optional. So now on the next slide, just um, highlighting some points from the guidance that this applies to both daily and event driven or PrEP. If a program chooses to do creatinine screening, this should not delay starting oral PrEPs um, or PrEP the initiation shouldn't be delayed by it and results can be reviewed at a follow-up visit. Moreover, if an abnormal creatinine um, clearance results of under 60 is found, the measurement should be repeated on a separate day because creatinine clearance varies and is influenced by all kinds of factors and you, know, you shouldn't stop oral PrEP based on a single measurement. Because particularly, particularly because often you know, abnormal creatinine clearance returns to a normal level. Um, at, at the next measurement. And even if it does not, it usually returns after stopping PrEP. 
if oral prep is stopped, it can be safely restarted. If, if creatinine clearance is confirmed to be above 90, one to three months after stopping prep. And if, uh, finally, one point, if creatinine clearance does not return to normal levels in, in, in the interest of person-centered care, it's also important to consider some other causes of renal insufficiency. Um, if you go to the next slide, so that was uh, big changes to um, what we are saying about kidney function monitoring and oral prep use, which hopefully simplifies um, delivery of oral prep. Um, there are not that many changes to HIV testing uh, guidance in the new guidelines. And just summarizing here, th this is already known, I'm sure to many of you, um, that the WHO um, uh, recommends um, uh, serial testing with validated um, with a validated testing algorithm using pre-qualified essays, um, which usually many things are third generation uh, rapid diagnostic tests. Um, and it, it, it's important that you know we suggest that once people are in, uh, people are initiated on prep, HIV testing is done regularly. Um, such as every three months or whenever people restart PrEP after a gap in use. If you go to the next slide, what is interesting is about HIV self-testing. Um, current guidance suggests um, that HIV self-testing can be used for demand creation, um, but it's not um, suggested for monitoring um, oral PrEP users. During COVID, WHO released guidance that um, suggested that essential health services like PrEP services can be maintained which is with HIV self-testing, apologies. Um, and many places in the world have now um, experience with HIV self-testing and that's something we are currently evaluating. Um, and some guidance on HIV self-testing for PrEP um, use is expected uh, either late this year or early next year in, in the broader guidance that we will provide on simplified um, PrEP. And there will be definitely guidance in new HIV testing um, guidelines uh, from WHO by the end of next year. So summary for HIV self-testing, there's not much new in the uh, just published WHO guidelines, but watch the space, there's more coming. If you go to the next slide, it is somewhat similar for hepatitis. Um, for hepatitis, the guiding principle for us uh, as the department of HIV, hepatitis and STIs, is that in many settings, people at risk of HIV are also at risk of hepatitis B and C infection. And PrEP services provide a unique opportunity to screen for hepatitis B and C and thus address multiple public health issues. We often get people coming to PrEP services that would otherwise have no contact with the healthcare system. So that's why we're saying it's a unique opportunity. Current guidelines um, suggest for hepatitis B on the, on the left-hand side, that it is suggested to test all PrEP users once um, at PrEP initiation for hepatitis B um, with several diagnostic tests uh, available, rapid diagnostic tests. Those with detectable um, antigen should be considered for treatment. And um, those who are negative should be considered for vaccination, depending on the country recommendation. So there, there's one thing in the guidelines, um, which uh, says that for event-driven oral prep use, those who live with chronic hepatitis B infection should not um, use oral PrEP in an event-driven fashion. So um, chronic hepatitis B infection is a contraindication for event-driven oral PrEP use. However, and I barely want to repeat that, is because this is currently under review and um, we are likely to change our guidance on this topic. So again, that's something that we will review, review and provide more guidance on later this year. If we switch out to the other side of the screen, hepatitis C, again, um, can be considered at PrEP initiation every 12 months, especially when we're looking at po populations that are at high risk of hepatitis B, such as uh, men who have sex and men, people who use drugs, and people in prisons and other closed settings. Those who are positive should be 
um, referred for further assessment and treatment where appropriate. And one thing to uh, emphasize uh, is that hepatitis C is no contraindication for oral PrEP use, whether, whether event-driven or daily. And in the same way as for hepatitis B, B and C, the, the testing should not delay PrEP initiation. PrEP can be initiated um, before the results are available. Just one reference here, WHO has released uh, guidelines recently on HIV, sorry, hepatitis C self-testing. Um, so there's an exciting new, new field and there's very limited experience using HCV self-testing within PrEP programs, um, but there's definitely potential there and something we would like to explore further. If you go to the next slide, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. I'm, I hope I'm on time. I haven't really checked, sorry. Um, but it, it, just going forward and thinking uh, about PrEP guidance by WHO, um, this slide to some degree summarizes our thinking that um, we recognize um, that we want to make PrEP service delivery more effective and efficient. Um, as said, sometimes WHO is criticized for releasing too complicated, overly medicalized um, guidance for, for PrEP. Um, so we are thinking about simplifying PrEP delivery, but in many uh, places, you know, it's all about a balance between providing the most basic services with PrEP um, and providing more of an ideal package. In an ideal package, you know, we would provide many more, um, more services, but, uh, you know, we recognize that these additional services can, can sometimes be a barrier to proper implementation. So that's something we are thinking about, about this balance between basic and, you know, more comprehensive services. And if you go to the next slide, um, there, I just highlight here that our thinking and future guidance will be released by WHO on, on the one hand. And, and what I mentioned is the simplification of all prep product. So some guidance on that is expected by the end of this year, early next year uh, will um, include uh, uh, among others, uh, you know, uh, some guidance on renal function monitoring, which we already discussed more on viral hepatitis and one self-testing, um, some guidance on community-based delivery of PrEP, including telehealth and also m &E. And another product to mention is the WHO PrEP implementation tool that was released in 2017. Uh, originally, we're also going to work on updating that next year. So watch the space, there's more guidance from WHO coming. And with that, I think I this was my last slide. Yes, I thank you. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I think there were some in the chat, but it wasn't really following. I can help you with that. Thank you so much, Robin. And, you know, I just really want to commend WHO for um, moving, you know, quickly in real time to try to update the guidance. It's it's been very impressive to see how you've moved forward on on these asp on the aspects you shared today, and I'm really excited to see the other simplifications coming in the future. But also noting that these are right now specifically for oral prep, and as we have other um, biomedical prevention options entering the market, we will need to sort of consider, you know, are there differences between products. Um, so there's one very technical question, which I have no idea what the answer is, but maybe you do from our colleague in, at ICAP in Myanmar, asks which EGFR calculation formula is preferable, CG or MDRD for Asians? So th this is a hugely complicated question, actually. Um, and I'm not a hepatologist, so please take my answer with some caveats. Um, most widely used CG, um, it by far is most widely used and is mentioned in our guidance as well, because it's a very simple formula um, that can be implemented in, in, in basically every setting. It just relies on making a serum creatinine measurement. However, we recognize that there are multiple formulas to, um, to estimate EGFR uh, or kidney function. Um, and CG is actually uh, generally considered inferior to some of the formulas you mentioned um, when compared to the gold standard. However, we also recognize that those other formulas um, have not always have not been uh, validated in as many populations. Um, you mentioned this specifically for Asia, uh, MDR 
MDRD, I think, uses a race term in it uh, in the calculation, which is why it's generally not considered to be a global measure uh, because it hasn't been validated in all settings. It was developed in the US and that's where the race term comes from. Um, and uh, I think it has been argued that you don't need that race term. That's why it's probably preferable, but we have just limited experience with that. So generally speaking, CG is fine, um, but others may be better, but we need more evidence on the use of these other formulas in different settings. But I also suggest looking into this topic in the literature because I may not be the best person to speak about this. Thanks. Oh, Christine, you're on mute. Thank you, Robin. Um, some of the questions are broader than what you were speaking about specifically today with the with the creatinine and hepatitis B, but more around what's what's coming up the pike with simplement, simplification. So, one question is uh, around the issue you raised around the term substantial risk, and what is what will it be replaced with? How are we understanding who prep is indicated for now? I realize this was not on your docket, Robin, for today's session. I don't know if you want to comment on this here or or have us be po keep stay tuned for future updates? Um, well, what I can say is that uh, in 2016, there was a previous consolidated um, guidelines. Uh, WHO, you know, they had this, this famous box of substantial risk uh, of HIV acquisition, and at the time uh, defined it as an HIV incidence of three per 100 person years. But that was kind of a provisional definition at the time it, that, that was... It was identified um, in the trials that uh, you know people not using PrEP often had at least a, a, this kind of um, HIV incidence, and it was uh, suggested that um, implementing PrEP in population with such an incidence that this would be cost effective uh, or even cost savings. Um, so that at the time was the thinking, but we now recognize that, that there's a huge variation within populations. Um, and risk really depends on individual behaviors and, and the characteristics of their partners. And even in, in location with low HIV incidence, um, there, there are likely to be individuals at substantial risk. So we, we're trying to move away from the pure view on HIV incidence, which is a population measure. It's a you know, epidemiological concept for population. Um, populations at risk, not necessarily individuals. So we, we we should, we would really encourage programs and projects to consider their local context and recognize this heterogeneity in risk um, rather than population level uh, HIV incidence. And there are many individuals within populations that can benefit from, from PrEP. And most importantly, and that's we have been saying for the years, is individuals who are requesting PrEP should be given priority to be considered and offer PrEP because the request of PrEP is likely to indicate that this individual can benefit from PrEP. So that's something just to emphasize again, that that's not a new thing, that's, but sometimes it's a bit lost, um, that people who request PrEP should be recognized. Um, and that's something we emphasize again in the, in the new guidelines. Thanks so much for that, Robin. And uh, there are more questions which uh, you know, we're going to actually need to move into our next presentation, but then we will have a more Q&A time at the end. Um, but just to highlight, there are questions around uh, simplification or uh, updates around transgender populations and PrEP and um, a question around uh, people who inject drugs. And then um, there was a question in the chat that I just want to say might be beyond the scope of today's topic, but it's has anyone had experience integrating COVID-19 vaccination along with PrEP initiation? And so I would welcome those who have that experience to go ahead and respond to that in the chat so that our colleague um, can maybe connect uh, outside, of, outside of this webinar on that topic. Um, so thank you again, Robin, and we'll come back to you with more questions as we have time. In the meantime, I'm gonna turn this over to Irvi Parikh to talk through some of the HIV drug resistance data that she that we have. Over to you, Irvi. Thank you. Um, good morning and good afternoon. Um, as Christine introduced, uh, my name is Urvi Parikh and I'm an associate professor of medicine at the University of Pittsburgh. 
I've been co-leading the GEMS project and will now be the drug resistance technical lead for Mosaic. So today I'll be presenting a brief primer on key concepts on the risk of drug resistance with PrEP and some results from our GEMS project. I'll cover three main topics. First, the question, how does a PrEP user get drug resistant HIV? Second, what can PrEP programs and projects do to monitor for HIV drug resistance? And third, what have we learned from PrEP resistance monitoring in the countries that have implemented it? The first key concept is that PrEP is highly effective at preventing HIV. An HIV negative person cannot have drug resistance. I want to emphasize this because sometimes it can get a little confusing when we talk about drug resistance and PrEP. Um, but it's really important to remember that when there is no infection, there is no resistance. So when we talk about drug resistance, we're only talking about those people who become HIV positive, um, not, not an HIV negative PrEP user. In the GEM study, which monitored for drug resistance with PrEP zero conversion and national programs in three countries and project partners in two countries, um, and I'll tell you a little more about this study a little bit later. Um, we found that only 229 zero conversions were reported over four years, with more than 104,000 people initiating PrEP. So PrEP is very successful at protecting people from HIV. And this reiterates the point, no infection means no resistance. So how does resistance happen with PrEP? There are two main ways that I'll talk about. One is transmitted drug resistance. Transmitted resistance happens when a PrEP user gets drug resistant HIV from a partner. This means that the partner passes on the resistant virus to them. A second way is called acquired drug resistance. This means the person became HIV positive with a virus that did not have drug resistance, but developed the drug resistance over time. So how would this happen? This could happen if a person keeps taking PrEP after becoming HIV positive. So they could start PrEP before they realized they were HIV infected. They could have stopped PrEP and then restarted. They could have missed some PrEP doses, um, which meant they didn't have enough PrEP doses to prevent infection. Um, and in very rare cases, if the PrEP didn't work. As Robin had mentioned earlier, it's important to get regularly tested on PrEP. Each X on this graph represents a person and how long after HIV infection it takes before um, that person would get a positive HIV test result. Um, and this is known as the window period. And so this is how acquired drug resistance um, could potentially happen. You can see that most of the time it takes at least three to four weeks after infection to detect the HIV. And it's possible, or I guess detect antibodies to HIV, and it's possible that it could take even longer on PrEP. And so if someone became HIV positive and kept taking the PrEP before they um, had an HIV test, um, that's one scenario in which resistance could potentially develop. So that we can better understand the risk of HIV drug resistance in people who become positive on PrEP, monitoring for drug resistance in PrEP programs can be very helpful. It can ensure the effectiveness of national PrEP programs and help understand if additional support is needed for PrEP adherence and or routine HIV testing. It can assess whether the frequency of HIV testing is adequate to capture seroconversions as quickly as possible, and it can support national HIV prevention and treatment programs by understanding the HIV drug resistance frequency with PrEP use. 
So as I mentioned, we conducted a project called GEMS to monitor for HIV drug resistance in national programs implementing PrEP. This slide shows several strategies that countries can use to monitor for HIV drug resistance. So the first is that a national research protocol to address uh, or assess HIV drug resistance in PrEP seroconverters can be implemented. Um, or second, partnering with existing PrEP demo projects um, can be done. These projects can then add drug resistance monitoring to their protocols or procedures. Um, and third, um, national surveillance that may already be in existence for pretreatment drug resistance and acquired drug resistance to include PrEP resistance monitoring um, can be done. Um, and the WHO has a new um, document now that uh, outlines with some guidance on how to implement a PrEP resistance monitoring program. Um, and so today I'm going to focus on this first strategy, implementing a national research program um, to our research protocol to assess HIV drug resistance and PrEP zero converters. Um, and in GEMS, we did this in partnership with the Ministries of Health in Kenya, Eswatini, and Zimbabwe. Um, and a little bit later, we'll hear um, about some of the experiences that um, our partners in Kenya and Eswatini had implementing this program. Um, we also, in the GEMS project, had partnered with projects in South Africa and Uganda. Um, and the data that I'll show uh, incorporates data collected from all of these projects. So to describe the procedures um, for HIV drug resistance monitoring with PrEP, um, we first, um, in these three countries, Eswatini, Kenya, and Zimbabwe, established a resistance monitoring protocol. Um, we then, um, through this protocol, collected blood from consenting HIV positive individuals these individuals had been prescribed PrEP in the last three months and became um, and tested HIV positive. So the testing we did was for PrEP drug levels and for HIV resistance mutations. Um, and so uh, the study overall was an observational cross-sectional study. It was conducted between December 2017 um, and sorry, that should say July 2021, not 2019. Um, it included current PrEP users um, who were defined as someone who had collected an initial supply or resupply of PrEP. Um, they were identified as HIV positive per the national HIV testing algorithm after PrEP initiation. They provided informed consent and overall in this project, samples were collected from 208 HIV positive individuals. So in the next couple of slides, I'll show you what we found. Um, the first finding was that those who became HIV positive on PrEP were mostly young, female, and they identified with various populations. So 75% of those who participated in GEMS were female and half were under age 25. So in this next slide, the graph, this graph shows how long after starting PrEP um, did a PrEP user become HIV positive. So what you see here on the um, bottom is the time from PrEP initiation to zero conversion in months. Um, and on the um, y-axis, it's the percent of participants. So in the first bar, it's showing, the first green bar, it's showing that after someone started PrEP, they became HIV positive within the first three months. And so what we see is, what we found was that the majority of participants initiated PrEP more than three months prior to becoming HIV positive, and about one-third of participants 
became um, HIV positive within the first three months. Um, finally, we evaluated all of those that became HIV infected for the presence of drug resistance mutations divided into three categories. Um, the three categories are no resistance mutations, resistance that was not associated with PrEP. Um, so this would be transmitted resistance to drugs that are not any of the PrEP drugs. Um, and resistance that was associated with PrEP as defined by having specific HIV resistance mutations that um, are associated with the drugs used for PrEP. I wanna point out that even though um, the third category is called PrEP associated, um, that resistance could have been because of PrEP or it could have been transmitted from a partner. Um, and so what our main finding was, was that 23% of seroconversions had PrEP-associated mutations. Um, we had several limitations um, in this study. One was that the timing of taking PrEP and HIV infection is not um, known. Um, and there may be a gap in seroconversion and sample collection for some participants. Um, we tried our best to collect the sample the day that the person um, had an HIV positive test, but that was not always possible. Um, we also don't know how many people were already infected when they started PrEP. Um, so the next slide is my last slide. Um, so in summary, I want to say that PrEP works. Um, this is the main message that people should remember. The number of reported infections was very small compared to the estimated number of people who initiated PrEP. So PrEP, uh, the fear of resistance should never be a reason not to take PrEP. Um, there is a small risk of resistance for people who become HIV positive on PrEP. However, having improved HIV diagnostics to detect HIV earlier and monitoring for HIV, drug resistance are important for both PrEP and treatment programs. Um, and with that, um, I will um, end the presentation and move on to the panel. Turn it back over to Christine. Oh, I think I'm passing on to you, Irvi, like okay, you're gonna great. share screen now, right? and walk us yes. through a panel discussion. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so that would be great. Okay, great. So let me see if I can, um, you know, if it's easier, sorry, we can just keep going. <laughs> no, I think no one, one of the things I just want to uh, highlight is, you know, there is in there is some interest in the chat. Our colleague from Nigeria mentioned it would be nice to have this work here, and I know you're going to kind of touch more on this, but how mm -hmm. how we can how you can support um, other countries and national governments to put some of this surveillance in place. Obviously, you know that we recognize budget limitations, et cetera, for all the testing, but um, it will be great if you can kind of flag some of that in your conversation, Irvi. Sure. Um, thank you, Casey. Sorry, I think I am. I think uh, it looks like it might just be easier if you keep going with the slides. Sure, no worry. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, great. Um, yes, we will um, address some of um, those comments uh, in the Q and A, and if if we don't already cover some of that in the in the chat, um, sorry, in the panel discussion. Um, Okay, so now I would like to again introduce um, Dr. Bhavna Chohan um, from Kenya and Dr. Anita, or sorry, um, Ms. Anita Hedema from Eswatini. Um, and it looks like maybe Everleen Bosek um, has not been able to join us yet, um, but hopefully if she does join us, um, she can join our conversation. So now that you have the background um, for some of the drug resistance, we wanted to focus the rest of the discussion with our panel to share experiences with HIV drug resistance monitoring with PrEP rollout. 
Um, so the way this will work is um, I will ask our panelists a series of questions and they're going to talk about their experiences and at the end, um, we're, we'll welcome any additional questions from the audience. Um, all right, so to get started, um, Kenya was the first country to implement um, PrEP. So um, let's start with uh, Bhavna. Um, can you talk about the process of including HIV drug resistance monitoring in your country's PrEP program? Um, thank you, Urvi, for inviting me to share uh, the experiences of this HIV DR monitoring in Kenya. Um, so in early 2017, Kenya recommended PrEP for all uninfected partners at high risk of HIV acquisition, which included HIV discordant couples, female sex workers, men who have sex with men, and adolescent girl and young women. Uh, PrEP was actually officially rolled out uh, and launched in May 2017 in Kenya. And we started uh, uh, the res drug resistant monitoring plans and initiated the drug resistance testing in June of 2018. The main key stakeholders were the Ministry of Health, uh, the National HIV and STI Control Program, we also involved the county AIDS and STI coordinators, healthcare workers, and partners who were doing the part, uh, PrEP demonstration trials. So currently in Kenya, we have an estimated uh, 58,000 PrEP users in the country, according to the Kenya Health Indicator Survey, and uh, an estimated 2,000 uh, PrEP sites are providing PrEP in the country in all the counties. So this is how we um, started the drug resistance monitoring in Kenya. Over to you, Urvi. Thank you, Bhavna. Anita, what did you learn from the Kenya experience and what would you highlight as a few key differences in Eswatini? Um, thank you for that question, Urvi. Um, so Eswatini definitely joined the party a bit later. We started PrEP in 2017 with demonstration sites, but only started a full scale up in 2019. Um, and although during the demonstrations uh, studies, there were very few zero converters um, identified, but when there was a rapid scale up, there were a lot of concerns from healthcare workers about PrEP resistance. So when there was an opportunity for the Ministry of Health or for the country to join um, the GEM study and to start HFPDI monitoring, um, they were very eager. Because Kenya had already started and also South Africa and, and, and Uganda, um, it was relatively easy for Eswatini to start it up. Um, we, we could learn from other countries. Uh, there was like an, an, a protocol in place that we could adapt easily for like the local context. And also training materials were already in place and that were easily adapted to the to the local context. So for Eswatini, it was the startup. Um, after we had also involved the different stakeholders and get their buy-in, it was relatively easy to start the HIV drug resistance monitoring. Thank you, Anita. Um, so for the next question. Um, uh, Bhavna, I wanted to ask you, why did Kenya decide to use a research protocol to conduct this monitoring rather than adding to an existing surveillance program? As I presented before, there were different options for how to do this surveillance. Um, how did the research protocol become the way to go for Kenya? Um, thank you, Urvi. That's, that's a very interesting question. Um, we debated this when we were uh, starting the drug resistance monitoring uh, uh, study. And since this PrEP zero converter study required return of uh, the drug resistance results back to the client and to the clinic, as well as we needed the participants' uh, consent to collect the blood sample, we had to set up the study as a research protocol um, and get approval from the local ethics committee for the study. Um, 
And though I know that the study would provide the national surveillance data on HIV DR um, for PrEP seroconverters in Kenya. So we decided to go with a research protocol rather than you add it to an existing surveillance program. Earlier, we had an approval uh, from ethics to have adults uh, over 18 years and above um, to be included and to collect the samples, but we had to amend the protocol as we had young uh, uh, adolescent girls, uh, less uh, around 16 years and above, as well as pregnant women. And so we had it as a study protocol and uh, uh, the inclusion criteria was also amended. Um, and so we continued doing it as a research protocol in Kenya. Over to you, Urvi. Thank you, Bhavna. Um, Anita, Eswatini also decided to go the research protocol route. Do you have any comments about that? I think it's very similar from what Bhavna said in Kenya. Um, we wanted to return clients their individual results. Uh, a protocol would allow us to collect some additional data, uh, for example, the self-reported adherence, and then also to the TDF, uh, the drug level monitoring. Um, so I think those were the main reasons. Um, drug resistance monitoring was not standard of care yet um, in Esrutini, so it was easier to do it as an as a uh, protocol, a research protocol. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit now about some of the logistics of the research or for, of the resistance monitoring. Um, so let's start with you, Anita. Um, were there any in-country systems for specimen collection or shipment that you were able to leverage or utilize um, when thinking about how to actually um, collect these specimens and get them tested? Sure, um, thank you, Avi. So in Eswatini, there's a national sample transport system and system they collect the samples from the different facility depending on the size of the clinic, uh, the geographic location, they will go daily or they go twice a week. And some of the smaller facilities, uh, they might only collect once a week. So the initial plan was to really use the existing sample transport system, uh, but that proved fairly quickly to be difficult. Um, HIV drug resistance testing is not done in country in Esatini. So all the samples need to be shipped uh, to South Africa for that. And it was, often impossible to get the sample in time. Um, so some study supported sample transport was also provided in order to get the samples in time at the, at the laboratory and then um, to transport them from there by courier to South Africa to the existing um, labs. I think the main challenge was that we were doing both DBS, the dry blood spots, and the whole blood. Well, so one of the, the DBS cards had to drive for several hours in order to, to, to have them transported. It, we had to, sh to ship the, the whole blood sample uh, faster to the lab. So that, that proved very difficult and it was not possible to use the existing sample transport in most times. Yeah, it sounds like it was quite challenging. Um, Bhavna, there is an HIV testing lab in Kenya was the logistics different for you there? Yes, in Kenya, uh, the logistics was slightly different from uh, Eswatini because we did have a WHO accredited lab, uh, a central lab uh, available in Kenya for doing the HIV drug resistance on dried blood spots. So we plan to use uh, dried blood spots uh, samples uh, to collect because they're easy to transport at room temperature. And we actually use the existing early infant diagnosis uh, program uh, and leveraged on that with the ongoing system to provide um, blood collection kits uh, to the AIDS STI uh, coordination offices in every single 47 counties in Kenya. And we also use the similar infrastructure, which was existing for early infant diagnostic uh, program to use the courier services for uh, shipment of samples from the site, uh, from the clinic to the central lab uh, for testing. So we were in a way slightly different from uh, Eswatini because we did have a, a lab that could uh, test the drug resistance and we could use the courier system which was existing in the country. Thank you. 
Yeah, it definitely makes things easier when, when you can leverage existing systems. Um, so for the next question, um, I know that Everleen, um, it seems like she has not been able to make it yet. So I'm going to pose this question to you, Bhavna. Um, what were some of the steps that were taken by healthcare workers after identifying a PrEP user who's seroconverted? So now we're getting even into like more details of the logistics. Um, what happened if someone seroconverted and you found out about this? Yeah, um, that's that's a very good question uh, because that's how we started. So if you can go to the previous slide, uh, we had it on the flow chart. So this may not look very clear uh, and it's not to be read, but you can see that whenever uh, these were flow charts which were made into A3 size laminated and stuck on all the, on the walls of all the prep sites uh, in the country, so as soon as a healthcare worker identified a PrEP user who became a HIV positive, uh, the next steps are given in this flowchart where they inform the client about the study um, and the consent for blood collection. They use the sample collection kit to collect the blood specimen. They prepare the dried blood spots and send it to the in-country lab for testing. Then they would phone our coordinator uh, to let us know about the seroconversion. Um, and they would go ahead and send the, uh, ship the sample to the central lab for testing. Uh, Urvi, if you can forward, we can show the LRF that the healthcare worker needed to fill up, which is after the question, uh, the slides, if you can forward them. So on the LRF, the healthcare worker would fill in the details and contact of the um, the clinic so that we could return the results back for the prepared seroconverter. The details of the PrEP client were also collected. That is the age, sex, the PrEP initiation date, when was the last negative HIV test, when did the first positive HIV test happen, the risk category for taking PrEP, um, the HIV zero status of the uh, sexual partners, as well as what current treatment the um, partner, if he was HIV positive, were they on which ART regimen, in uh, little details about self-report or adherence to PrEP, whether it was good, fair, or bad, was also collected by the healthcare worker. And this slide is showing you an example on the left for the Kenya um, lab requisition form. And the other one is for the one they use in South Africa and um, in Eswatini from the Bark Lancet Laboratory, which also collects all this information. Thank you. Over to you, Urvi. Thank you, Bhavna, for sharing all of those details. Um, it's, it's important to have that worked out to make sure all of this goes smoothly. Um, Anita, um, how did you approach training for the healthcare workers that were interacting with the PrEP clients and other stakeholders, um, you know, to run this protocol, I am sure it required a lot of new information to be shared. Sure. Um, before we actually even started the training and even prior to the protocol approval, we did a large sensitization meeting during one of the, the national HIV semi-annual review meetings. And that was a great opportunity to get buy-in from healthcare workers, um, to get their concerns and, and just to get a general feel and even some suggestions for implementation. Um, and they were all taken, we, we were using some of those comments in, uh, when we did the protocol. So then as soon as we received the ethical approval, we started training and we did our trainings at national, regional, and also at facility level. We trained a group of like um, mentors, the nurse mentors. Um, we trained the nurses and we trained HDS counselors. And where possible, we integrated the training as much as possible in existing prep trainings from the ministry and also in some of the uh, refresher trainings for like our HIV uh, counselors. What we noticed like, it's of course very important to train as many people as possible. Um, because the level of uh, sharing among 
uh, nurses at facilities really differs per facilities. Some are doing a lot better than others. But also the training is so important to build the relationships and to really, um, after the training, to maintain that so that there's no barriers um, for healthcare workers to reach out to you. So even if they would be unclear about when they identify a zero converter, because of those relationships that were built during the training, um, it was easier for them to reach out with questions and then to provide that ongoing telephonic um, support. Thank you, Anita. Those are such important points about relationship building um, and having good communication um, as part of successful implementation of this project. Um, so it sounds like maybe Everlene is with us now. Um, Everlene, are you, are you there? Can you hear us and see us? Yes, hi, I'm there. Hi, Everlene, thank you for um, joining. I want to ask um, about implementation best practices um, and what procedures you use to ensure successful implementation of resistance monitoring. Um, Casey, next slide, please. Okay, um, to ensure successful implementation, we conducted trainings for prep service providers using different approaches. Uh, we utilized both the in-person and virtual training and we also trained trainer of trainees who were supposed to cascade the training to the service providers at the facility level. And to add on that, we also had the standalone trainings with the implementing partners. And to add also, we had regular communication with the lab prep sites and we did quarterly check review for all the LRFs that were received to ensure that uh, the information recorded on the LRF were accurate and uh, on quarterly basis, we were, we were able to conduct assessment visits with prep sites that had reported seroconversion. And to ensure that we had details of all seroconversion reported, we set up a national database for prep seroconversions. And in addition, we had, a regular, we had regular communication with the national program that is NASCOP, and we were able to be invited to national technical working groups due to a good rapport that we had with them, among other, meet, other meetings that were organized by the, by the national program. And in addition, also, we were able to share the drug resistant results with the national program to ensure that uh, PrEP facilities had, had better treatment uh, guidance whenever they, get, they got results and they were not able to end to we were not able to interpret the mutations that were reported. So the national program was able to assist those facilities and guide them on treatment options. Back to you, Orve. Thank you, Everlene. Um, yes, it sounds like communication is a key theme for the successful implementation. Um, so now um, this is a question uh, for, for all of you. Uh, COVID unfortunately has been a reality of our lives for the past um, over a year. And so I wanna ask you about adapting during the COVID-19 lockdowns and, um, and adapting this protocol to account for interruptions due to COVID. Um, Anita, maybe I can start with you. Um, how did you adapt so that resistance monitoring could still occur during this time? Sure. Um, so for Esotini, actually, uh, fairly quickly after we got our approval, the country went into a full lockdown. So we only had done like one set of regional trainings. Um, and yeah, we had very little saturation among our prep facilities. Um, the country, or we made a specific choice not to continue with virtual online trainings. And the only reason was really that the country was trying, we were trying to train healthcare workers, unlike all the COVID measures, and we didn't want to take any time over them. So what we did, we shared, uh, we distributed, of course, the job aids and the algorithms, very clear. Um, we also shared training slides, and we gave a message, really, that if you identify them, contact us, we'll phone you back, and we talk you through all the procedures. Um, and we managed really to reach most facilities with these messages. And that proved actually that was fine. Um, after the first wave, of course, as soon as we were, when we were able to train, we, we restarted training again. 
um, actually face to face. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Everlene, can you tell us about your experiences in Kenya with COVID and resistance monitoring for PrEP? We seem to have um, lost Evelyn. She's here. She oh, just sorry. unmuted it. Looks yeah. Like. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> so during uh, the COVID nineteen uh, period, uh, we also we our, we adapted it uh, almost similar to the Eswatini the Eswatini team, and we utilized we utilized the virtual platforms. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, we utilize the virtual training platforms to ensure that communication with the prep facilities was ongoing, and also the training that we had scheduled was also on schedule, uh, without having to uh, postpone the trainings that we had planned with the county, the Minister of Health at the county level. So basically, that's how we adopted to resistance monitoring, monitoring and ensure that uh, sample collection could, could uh, continue without uh, facing any technical hitches. Thank you, Everlene. Um, so um, to wrap up, um, we have uh, just um, maybe one more question for the panel. Um, I think maybe we can talk about some of the successes and challenges during the um, during the Q and A. Um, so, if you move on to the last slide, um, maybe we can just do a round robin and take mention some key takeaways. Um, starting with Anita, what were some key takeaways from your experience implementing monitoring with Prep? Sure, um, I'll just highlight just um, any two key takeaways, I think, because of time, but I think, uh, first of all, just the open communication um, with Ministry of Health, with, tech, uh, with like stakeholders, and to, to provide regular updates, it's really important, it's important for the collaboration and to get buy-in. Um, and in Eswatini, we managed to, to, to give updates during the different technical working groups and other forums. Um, there's generally limited um, information um, on drug resistance, and most of it is focused on care and treatment. So I think that's very important that we make that available, job aids and training materials. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's quite a bit available now through the study that can be adapted for other countries. Um, and then maybe the very last takeaway that I think if a country starts a monitoring drug resistance among um, prevention clients, um, it's important that you really define for your country well who is eligible for the HVDR monitoring, but also who is considered to be a PrEP zero converter, because those are not always the same. And we definitely noticed like um, that it can create confusion also among healthcare workers. So for example, um, a client who has been taken PrEP and then discontinues and a couple of months later is identified positive, um, could be eligible for HFEDR monitoring, but you can't really, the client is not necessarily having a breakthrough infection. Um, and then it might look for your program that you have a lot of seroconverters because of failed PrEP. Well, you cannot, it's, it's unclear, you don't know if those are, Filled prep clients, or they just zero converted because of discontinuing prep and no longer having an effective HIV prevention method. Um, and I think that's something important to clarify um, in order not to like discourage healthcare workers, like not to offer and to support clients with prep use. Thanks. Thank you, Anita. Um, I want to appreciate. Um, you and and Bhavna and everything that the countries have done. Um, to run these uh, prep monitoring programs. So, Bhavna, maybe to end um, our session, can you tell us some key takeaways from Kenya? I agree with what uh, Anita shared about Eswatini. Um, you know some of the points, uh, and uh, we learned that it it is possible to conduct such a large national study that can obtain surveillance data for a national program 
by mentioning some of the points that uh, Anita raised, you know, having constant communication with the stakeholders, using the existing infrastructure for national programs could also help having training materials and uh, conducting trainings um, uh, could indeed uh, have such a you know, uh, success in implementing this uh, program and be able to provide uh, uh, data for the national surveillance on drug resistance for PrEP. So that was our main key takeaway uh, uh, from uh, implementing this four-year uh, study in Kenya. Thank you, Urvi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bhavna, Everleen, and Anita, and congratulations um, to all of you for having such um, successful implementation of PrEP resistance modeling, uh, monitoring, and being a model for others um, who may be interested in doing the same. Thanks. I'll turn it back over to Christine. Thanks so much, Irvi, and thank you, Anita, Bhavna, and Everleen. Um, we are going to uh, go over the GEMS toolkit materials, and I'm going to ask Lisa Levy to go over that and then have a little time for Q&A. Our, our session goes until 10.30. Um, so hopefully folks, we lost a few people as the hour changed, but we still have uh, over 125 people on. So we'll just keep going here. Lisa? Yes, thank you. Um, I'll be quick so we can leave a lot of time for Q&A. Um, so after hearing these great reflections on implementing a drug resistance monitoring program, you might be asking yourself, and as a matter of fact, we saw some chats about how you would go about setting up a drug resistance program and are there materials available to help you get started? And the answer is yes. Um, over the last few years, we've worked to develop tools and resources to support these projects. And I wanted to just share briefly an overview of what those tools are and where they're available. So we can get to the next slide. Um, so the main takeaway here for you is this website, prevwatch.org slash gems. It's where all of our toolkit materials are located. And when we have new ones, we will add them to the site. Um, and I do wanna point out that the materials are organized by audience on this site. So you'll see categories for healthcare workers, lab personnel, policy makers, and prep implementers. But um, as you can imagine, a lot of the tools will overlap across those groups. So we encourage you to look through all the materials. So let's look a little bit closer at a few. If we can go to the next slide. Um, and I think anybody that's probably worked in the field of drug resistance knows that it could be a complicated topic. And so you might want a fact sheet that is a quick overview about drug resistance and what it means in the context of PrEP to potential participants that might be enrolling in your study. So here's one example of what a fact sheet might look like to help explain that. Um, next slide. Let's say you're implementing a PrEP program and you realize, of course, that the risk of drug resistance when an individual starts or continues to use PrEP while they're in the acute seroconversion phase is critically important to assess for. So what tool might you want for that? Well, here's a one-page acute seroconversion assessment to help guide healthcare workers, not only to recognize the symptoms of acute seroconversion, but also to provide some guidance on next steps related to HIV testing. Next. So now let's say you have initiated a drug resistance monitoring project and you have a PrEP user that has a positive HIV test. As Irvi described earlier, those are gonna be very rare cases when you have those positive tests. So it'll be important to use, have a mechanism to remember the steps involved with consenting the individual, collecting the sample and what you need to do for shipment. So we put together a job aid, as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, really as a quick reference for healthcare workers, um, helpful for training and for other ways, just to remember the steps involved for specimen collection and shipment. If you go to the next slide, You'll see we also created a, a how-to video um, on how to create a DBS card, a dried blood spot. Um, this is about a five-minute video, and we found it could be useful for trainings when you're conducting protocol trainings or other just practice sessions for people who are not familiar or maybe a bit rusty with creating those DBS cards. Um, thank you. And then I do want to just mention we have much more, and I don't really want to um, spend too much time going through all of these, but I want to highlight them. 
um, so that you can go to the website and look a little bit more closely. We have a template protocol that you might want to use and adapt to create your own monitoring program in your country. We have lots of training slides, uh, the video, the job aids, et cetera, that I just mentioned to implement the study. Um, we have monitoring and evaluator, evaluating indicators, SOPs. We have a HIV testing fact sheet that describes the characteristics of available point of care and rapid HIV tests. So a lot of great information here, um, and we do encourage you to look closely and reach out to us if you want some more technical assistance. Um, and if you would like some more information about these tools or just in general, how to set up a program. Um, and then I guess just on the last slide, I wanted to mention that all of these projects that were described today um, that our colleagues discussed on the panel and along with all the resources I just mentioned, they were developed in very close coordination with a whole host of partners across many countries, including um, the laboratories we work with. So I want to thank all of them and thank all of you for listening today. Um, and now I think we will open it up for some questions. I've seen a few in the chat. And Christine, I'll hand it back over to you. Great, thanks so much, Lisa. And, and those resources are really terrific and hopefully folks will be able to take advantage of them. So we have some really good questions here and some challenging ones. I'm gonna start, um, there are a lot, there's a lot of the conversation is around this issue of acute HIV infection and how that plays in here. And you know, to what extent we are actually capturing um, uh, serial conversion on PrEP versus perhaps um, uh, inconsistent PrEP use, uh, and then serial conversion in that context. Uh, so one one question related to this um, from Cheryl Johnson from WHO is: What improvements in HIV diagnostics do you see as most important? And what trade-offs do you see in terms of more expensive or complex HIV testing, reducing PrEP reach and impact? It's a big question, Irvi. <laughs> um, yes, it is a very challenging question. Um, I mean, this is sort of looking ahead, but I think these uh, diag the issue of diagnostics will be very important for CAB LA, maybe more so than it is for oral prep. Um, I would still say like, I, like the proportion of those who became infected is still quite small with oral prep and um, probably most uh, frequent testing can still work as a way to um, mitigate um, the infections and you know basically staying on prep um, for a long time before knowing HIV status is probably the biggest risk for drug resistance. So, um, you know, thinking about the reality of trying to um, do something like viral load testing, I think might be uh, too much of a barrier for starting PrEP. And I don't think we should try to, you know, um, put up any more barriers given that PrEP is, is so effective at preventing HIV. Um, so sorry, that's not a great answer, but I think um, as, as we have better technologies and as we think about um, how we're going to do this for newer agents like Cab LA, um, it, it's something I think we just need to keep working on. Thanks, Irvi, absolutely. I think, and if anyone wants to add their thoughts about this issue in the chat, uh, you're most welcome to do so. Um, uh, so I'm going to move on to another question, questions that sort of relate to how does the frequency of drug resistance among PrEP users compare with the frequency of drug resistance around non-PrEP using serial converters? <laughs> also, um, also a very important question. Um, so we, um, we were not able to have a concurrent group of people that we followed who were not on PrEP who serial converted, but we do have some data from the ECHO project in South Africa and some from Kenya. And what was interesting was the frequency of NNRTI resistance was about the same in GEMS as it was in ECHO. So ECHO was, in ECHO, um, they had data from 
individuals who had become HIV um, positive. And so they knew they were new infections and not just newly diagnosed. Um, they were actual zero conversions. Um, so the NNRTI resistance, which is not PrEP related, the rates were similar, um, but the rates were higher for PrEP related resistance in the GEM study um, than they were in ECHO. I think that's expected in the sense that um, NRTI transmitted resistance rates are still pretty low um, in, in the communities in which PrEP is being rolled out, but NNRTI resistance rates um, are much higher. I think you mentioned this earlier, but it may be worth just um, re-emphasizing that this was really real-world data. And even though we're mm -hmm. talking about it as a research study, it's not a, it was not a research study like the ECHO trial or a clinical right. trial. It was a research study in that there was a protocol and there was informed consent to participate, but the mm -hmm. data was collected from very real-world settings. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about some of the unknowns about these data. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Absolutely. Um, these, um, there were so many things as in this project that could not be done that were done in trials. So um, we did not have a sample from when somebody started PrEP. Um, that would help us know if someone started PrEP already HIV infected. Um, in the clinical trials, you could go back to that stored sample and test it for viral load. We could not do that here. Um, we, we could not follow people um, after seroconversion to see how they did on therapy um, later on, the way that could be done in trials. We also were not actually following people. This was a cross-sectional one-time sample collection um, from someone who uh, came to a public clinic in the countries in which we were um, working and provided a sample for drug resistance testing. It was run more like a surveillance and not like a, a traditional um, a research study um, where you would have more samples and more testing and um, frequent follow-up counseling, all of, the, all of those things. So um, yes, that is important to keep in mind for context. There are a lot of unknowns um, and I think it just still gives us an idea of what we're looking at in terms of drug resistance um, occurrence um, in this setting. Absolutely. And I think it highlights the importance of doing that drug resistance surveillance. Um, so I saw Anita put something, a comment in the chat, and I thought that might be useful to share. Anita, do you want to just uh, verbally share your comment from the chat? Um, sure, Christine. Um, yeah, what I just mentioned um, in the chat actually that because we noticed when so so I think just the study on its own really helped to improve like identifying zero converters and reporting them to the national system in the first place. But when we saw that actually like a fair number of those zero converters we identified were actually identified at the first follow-up visit already so most likely there were missed acute HIV infections and I think that really helped the program to realize that this is a problem and we need to improve our training on identifying acute HIV infection so the screening tool of course was was distributed but people were trained on it and we integrated it much more in other existing trainings and not just only for nurses but also for our HCS counselors who are often the, the, the people who are doing the HIV testing. Um, so I think you know, those are also opportunities really that a program can learn and then actually improve on it. Um, another thing that I really like to mention, and this is very, this is definitely not something that is decided, but there are also now some discussions definitely in country going on, like, should we see um, if the country can afford to start like the combined uh, antigen antibody testing before PrEP initiation, like the first generation thing, uh, the first generation HIV testing. Um, so those are discussions that are still ongoing. Thank you. Thanks so much. That was really helpful, Anita. 
I also wanted to turn over to our colleague, Robin Akel, who's on in the panelist room from USAID. And Robin, you had a question around um, looking at this data in comparison to other modeling data. Do you want to expand on that question or comment? Um, sure. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. Hi, everyone. Um, Irvi, I was just curious if you had kind of taken your findings and looked back at the previous modeling like that Ume Abbas has done and others um, and sort of looked at whether they've aligned with that previous modeling to kind of look at the likelihood of generating resistance from prep use versus ART and, and transmission from infected partners. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's a, a great question. Um, we, we have not gone back um, to the modeling data to do that specific analysis. Um, but I would say overall, I think it still stands true that the co overall contribution of drug resistance in the community is, is far higher from um, those who uh, are, who are, um, whose treatment is not working um, than from PrEP. I mean, just looking at the numbers in terms of the number of people on treatment, the number of people who may not have successful treatment and the viral loads, um, I, I think the contribution of resistance is still greater from treatment than PrEP. And that's kind of the take home messages that Ume Abbas's work has always showed. But yes, it would be interesting to go back um, now that we have the actual data to um, see if they would be interested in updating their models with it. Yeah, I think um, I think it actually might be quite close. I can't remember exactly the percentages that they um, reported, but your mm -hmm. what was the percent of potential resistance from prep? Because it's like twenty seven people out of yeah, it was plus. A, it was about a fifth or like twenty three percent with the data that we have now. Um, but and not again, twenty three percent of a hundred thousand, right? It was. 23% of, well, for, of those who became something. positive. So like the 208 participants. Um, so basically uh, from those who became infected, 23% had mutations that were affiliated with the PrEP drugs. Um, we, we can't make a conclusion on if they were transmitted or if they were actually selected by the PrEP drugs, but we can just say that those mutations were associated with tenofovir or FTC um, resistance. Thanks, Irvi and Robin. Um, Sarah's asking a question about, is there a forum to, to follow the discussion on fourth generation diagnostics? And I don't know what that forum would be. So I'm just, but Anita and Irvi, I mean, we do talk about it periodically in these <laughs> sessions. Yeah, I, I don't know of a specific forum. Um, I know that fourth generation diagnostics um, are promising. Um, there's probably more, more that needs to be known on how much they actually shorten the window period enough to, you know, be worth changing algorithms, but um, Maybe Robin Schaefer from yeah, WHO. Um, well, I, I, I wouldn't know either what the form for that discussion would look like, um, but I think generally, I'm, I'm not sure Cheryl is still in the chat. Maybe she can put a note in there. Um, I think she stepped out. Generally speaking, our stance is, a, is currently is that, you know, in most places, third generation HIV testing is used and works well. Uh, the added benefit of fourth generation HIV testing is it, it's relatively small. Um, and as you were saying, it's, it's kind of a bit unknown how, how much that benefit actually you know, would add up to. And that needs to be put in perspective of costs of those uh, fourth generation tests. Um, but also know just throwing this in there next year, um, WHO is I think it's towards the end of next year, the data not really confirmed, will release new guidelines on HIV testing. Um, so 
WHO is considering that that, that whole topic, um, but it will take a while until new guidelines come out on that. That we look forward um, to this that. This is Thank Robin. You. Go ahead, Robin. Sorry, Christine. I could just quickly add. There's been a, a lot of discussion on this in the Asia region, and I know that Kim Green was researching this, so she might be a good person to connect with. Great. Thank you so much, Robin and Robin. Can we just show the next slide? I know we're at time. Um, I just want to highlight that uh, there are a few upcoming events in particular for the PrEP Learning Network, but in particular, it will, these, these efforts will be at ACASA. So you can see that if you are able to join ACASA, we will be focusing in on, um, on PrEP and FP integration, on the depivering ring, on um, PrEP at 2.0, which is a, a tool for that helps support PrEP targeting, as well as PrEP for pregnant and breastfeeding women. So hopefully you can join us then. We will not have another PrEP Learning Network session beyond these ACASA sessions in this calendar year, but we will be planning a new series for the coming year. Thank you all so much for joining. Um, as, as has been mentioned in the chat, all of this is posted on the website. Uh, the the, the uh, presentations, the recordings, and Q&A. Thank you so much to our speakers and panelists. It was a great meeting and discussion. So wish you all a good day. Thanks. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.